Hello everybody, welcome back, or if it's your first time, welcome. Today's guest is someone I spent a bit of time with over the years. He's a stand-up comedian, he's, he's, he's a writer, he's an actor. He's done a lot more than I realised on television, film and the theatre. I'm hugely looking forward to talking to him. I hope you enjoy this. Please welcome Mr. Miles Jump. I've been looking forward to this one, to the thought of spending a bit of time with you. Well, that's very nice. It's very nice to be asked, Robert. You are calling us from home, yes? That's right, yeah. Not, not for Miles Jupp, the, the glitz of London's Mayfair, or <laughs> perhaps the trendiness of Primrose Hill. No, tell the, the viewer slash listener where you are. I'm calling in from uh, South Wales, from Mon Monmouthshire, the part of the world where Rob Brydon hails from. Yeah, this is where my wife is from. So that's, that's I did used to live in, not in Trendy Mayfair. That, I lived in Peckham for many years and um, Kilburn before that, Nunhead. When we had our fifth child, we realised that we could no longer live where we were living without things getting a bit, um, bit cramped. I think it was the last time you came on to Would I Lie to You? I said to you, oh, I, you know, I love the fact that you live, you live there, you're not trying to be part of the, ooh, you know, in London, but you, you, you're there. And you said something like, no, it's a, it's a bloody nightmare in terms of, <laughs> in terms of the travel. Well, it, it is quite a long way, but I think I've had a quite a, you know, we've all had quite a lot of time to think, I think, over the last year. And actually, just when you get to spend a lot of time where you are, you're not traveling, uh, you know, things are, are so much better better in a way I mean and actually under sort of Covid things there's something the sort of thing that I used to end up in London for two or three days for it turns out you could just get there and back it wasn't I don't know what I must have just been wasting my time I must have been building in thinking well if I'm going all the way to London I probably ought to have dinner with a couple of friends shouldn't I It'd be nice to have just just nice to get a wagamama on my own as well so I'll make sure I'll probably whatever it turns out none of that was necessary at all you could just go there and come straight home again I think when I was born my dad was a chaplain at University College London now the church you moved to was in sort of West Hampstead, so um, that that was sort of quite a rarefied place to grow up. And I guess I until I was about nine or ten, I assumed that the whole world was like was like that, and yeah. that they'd have you know Oscar winners in their street or whatever. I didn't, you know, I didn't, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of ludicrously, perhaps delightfully cosseted, I guess. So I grew up there, and then we moved to the East Midlands, and and then I went to Scotland for university. You studied divinity. Yeah, I'm going to be breathtakingly honest here. What is that? Is is that churchly things? Yeah, that's that's kind of a fancy word for theology, I suppose. That's the first time in my life you suddenly you know you've gone somewhere like well, that's where you've gone under your own steam in a way, or you feel like you're there out of choice, or you know partly as a result of your A level results, obviously. But but you're like that's a place that I've chosen to go to, and I and I just kind of loved it, and that's why I started doing stand up, and you know I liked acting at school, and then I got into doing sort of comedy stuff when I was about twenty, I guess. But, but why were you studying divinity with, that, with a view to doing what? No, I, I, I just thought, uh, rightly, that it would be an interesting subject. I th for ages I thought I wanted to study classics, which is like sort of Latin and Greek. And, but I, th I thought people that did classics were recruited to be spies. And I understood that that was essentially the system. But I also seemed to be the subject that people that were very clever would do. All, all I can do is sort of seem clever, really. Whereas that, and, that, and you can't, you can't, that's not a world in which you can sort of bluff your yeah. way. And you get to the end of university, and did you go straight into comedy, or did you go anywhere else, into anything else first? No, well, I, I was sort of already doing it, really, because I, I, I did that, the sort of, I started, started getting, like, paid gigs when I was first year, second year. And then when I was in third year, I got a job in a children's television programme. By then, that sort of meant that I kind of was making a living. Was there any reticence on your part to, to, to take the role of Archie the Inventor <laughs> in Balamori, with it being a children's programme? Although, you know, there's a rich seam there. Jeremy Irons, famously, we can see him in... He was in Play Days, play, wasn't he? Play Away. Play away was it? And Dara, Dara used to present something, something Island, I think it was. Oh, in, did uh, he? In Ireland, but, yeah, but yeah. Did hang around you? You see, when I was young, I, I, uh, this rang a bell with me because I was a presenter on the Shopping Channel, on Sky, and and it's and it exists out there on, on YouTube, and and I really, I'd rather prefer it didn't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to search Palamori. 
But is there any... Are any of the things that you sold still commercially available? I mean, if I watched a snippet of it, would I think, God, I wouldn't mind a steam cleaner you, or whatever. The, the bit that's on does YouTube... It still, does it still stand up as salesmanship? Uh, well, I like to think it does, but it's nothing to be proud of, is it? Well, any, you know, any sort of community, anything that touches people's lives, Rob, that makes, a, that makes a difference, that ultimately helps them get cleaner carpets, whatever it might be. When it started, it was on like a channel that wasn't even, that was sort of brand new. You know, you had to have a sort of a digi box or mm -hmm. something. On, on, and so I, my agent at the time, my, he, he was like, well, look, it's 22 weeks of filming and it's X much a week and no one will ever see it. And you'll get to learn how to do all this sort of, you know, you've got no training. Yeah, yeah. You'll learn, you'll yeah. learn how to do that kind of stuff. We must have been making it for a while before it actually became sort of successful or, no, or noticed. After the programme had ended, a, you know, a year or two, remember at a charity auction, someone said, um, can you come do a birthday party? <laughs> uh, and I said, yeah, OK. So they, they did this. Uh, it was in Scotland. I went, I went there and uh, they'd hired the costume. Um, and I went upstairs and there was the costume sort of laid out on the bed, like a sort of scene, you know, like, like one of those films in which uh, Russell Crowe inexplicably puts loads of prosthetics on to do one really sad scene where he's an older version of himself. And I went into the room and there was the costume there. And I was like, oh, right, you know, and I, so I put the costume on and I thought, right, well, it still, you know, still fits. Of course it fitted. I mean, it was massive. I gave myself so much leeway. But I, I put the costume on. And um, I thought, well, I wonder what I wonder what I'm, you know, I wonder what they what they've got in store for me. I wonder what their idea is. And then, then someone came up and said, right, here we go. Um, so everyone's downstairs. They don't know you're here. Um, about five minutes time. We're just going to press the. You'll hear the theme tune. Come downstairs. And I went, okay. And, they, and um, yeah. And then and then what happens? And they said, oh, well, you, you do your thing. I haven't got a. I don't know what I would do. And they went, what did you think? You think I've got to go down. I've got to go. Oh God, that cake's got to come out. Whatever. And they go off. And I just stood at the top of the stairs thinking, I don't have a thing. What would, what's the thing? I literally had no idea what to do. And I just sort of sat there with my head in my hands and eventually the music came on and I came downstairs and the children were like, you know, because they're small children. I'm like a six foot one man that they're used to seeing on a sort of small thing. They're kind of, oh! And I just sort of, like, there was a cake being served. So I wandered around, talked to how delicious, about the, delicious the cake looked, uh, sort of tried to find out whose birthday party it was and said, you know, happy, happy birthday. From the first hearing the first musical note of the theme tune at the top of the stairs, I reckon five minutes after that, I was standing out in their garden in the outfit, throwing a ball for their dog. I had <laughs> had absolutely no idea what to do. It was terrifying. So just the words "just fill" or "do your thing" are all, always send an absolute shiver down my spine. What do you think of yourself as? Because you had a lot more film credits and theatre credits than I realised. I was aware of some of them. You have made a lot of films. So do you class yourself as actor or stand-up? What do you think of yourself? Yeah, that, that's kind of what I think of myself as. I mean, I, when you say... I always think, like, if you've got the main part in a film or a big part, then you can say, oh, we were making a film or whatever. Whereas me, generally, I've been in a film or whatever. I've been in... I don't know, 17 or 18 probably, but sometimes I'm just saying, sir, or... Um, and how do you handle um, long runs? What's the longest run you've done? I did a play called People at the National for nine months, I think. Now, I wanted to talk to you about that because that's Alan Bennett. Yeah. So presumably you met Alan Bennett. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was an amazing thing for me actually it was not long after we have twin boys who are um so they had just been born and so all sorts of things going on in your head and quite a tired tired period of my life i had the audition for it and i went and i it was at the national and i i bumped into a friend of mine for whatever reason when you go to you meet someone that you know at an audition i always think oh of course they're here they're going to get it and I, even though it's ludicrous, and then for whatever reason, I got recall, and I went in the next day, and the next day it was just Nick Heitner and Wendy, the casting director, and Alan Bennett, who had come through the stage door while I was sort of waiting nervously, and I just went into a room, and there was the three of them there. And almost like this sort of not being prepared thing that I was talking about earlier, they said, oh, they'd like to have a meeting with you. And I thought, oh, I wonder... And I literally sat on the bus thinking, I wonder what they want to talk about. So I tried to sort of prepare in a sensible way and imagine, 
you know, things that we might discuss, maybe aspects of, you know, what, but of course what they meant is come in and do the lines again, which the night before I'd been doing, you know, sort of word perfectly, but they just sort of sat in my pocket on the bus and they went, right, so it was, hi, how are you? Oh, that's what I should have been preparing is the lines from the play, not sort of interesting things I could say about a private function or a <laughs> drinking party, or whatever it was. For whatever reason, it was fine. They, it went well, and I remember just saying a line and, and him laughing, which I'm thinking, oh. I know, he said, yeah, well, we'd, we'd, we chatted a bit, and he said, well, we'd love you to do it. Well, they said that to you in the room. He said it in the room. Wow. That's very nice, but that, is this how it works? Is that just him being nice, or is there a buck coming? And I went, right, well, yeah, uh, okay, uh, great, well, really nice to see. And then I went out and I said to the casting director on the, get in the lift, I was like, well I, well, I hope this happens then. That sounded quite sort of positive. And she was going, well, yes. And I was going, yeah. It's quite positive. They've offered you the job. <laughs> yes, but I didn't quite believe it worked like that. So I went out and I remember sort of walking up and down the South Bank and I rang my agent and I said, I think it went quite well. Uh, but I don't know if they've, I don't really know if they've given it to me because that wouldn't, that's not how it would work, is it? I normally, you call me if I've got something. Anyway, she rang a bit later. She said, yeah, no, you have. You've been offered the job. You've definitely got it. And I said, did you ask what happened? And she said, yeah. <laughs> Carson director said, yeah. And he came in and he read and it went very well. And uh, we offered him the job and uh, he looked incredibly overwhelmed and left. And I was like, oh, right, that is, yeah, that is, that is precisely what happened. What, one last thing, that the story that intrigued me when I, when I was looking you up was you're a cricket fan yeah you were in india and you blagged your way so this would be about 2005 2006 and I was, i'm i'm very into cricket still very into cricket and i was sort of drifting slightly i didn't know what i wanted to do in my life and i got it in my head that i wanted to become a cricket journalist because i just wanted a job where you watched cricket all day what could be you know there's 2005 ashes have been going on which is a very exciting time basically if i got into the press box and just was there, then I might get work, um, was the sort of the logic of it. You know, I, m I remember reading this, um, there's a, uh, Barry Norman wrote this autobiography and in it there was a bit when he was completely out of work and he just used to sit in El Vino on Fleet Street. And if anyone said, how are you, Barry? He'd say, I'm very busy, but yeah, fine, how are you? And after a while, people would say, I know you're really busy, Barry, but could you possibly do this for us? And he'd go, well, well, I'll try. And by doing that, he sort of built up being busy again. So I thought if I just got in there and looked busy, and so I had to, I just thought I need to find a way of getting a press pass to get in there. But I got someone at BBC Scotland. So I would, I would be doing stuff at BBC Scotland at like Ballamore and then floor show. And I would go and do like Fred McCauley's morning show. So I knew the building well. I was, would wander around and people knew people. And I had said to someone, I had this idea. And could they introduce me to someone in the sports department? And I got them to basically write a letter on headed note paper saying that I was the BBC Scotland or a, a cricket correspondent for BBC Scotland. And then once I had that, I rang up the England and Wales Cricket Board and I said, hi, it's Miles Jupp, I'm the chief cricket correspondent for BBC Scotland. I'd just like to sort out travel for the, uh, the India tour, please. And they s said, yeah, absolutely fine. I mean, which, what, what do you want? Uh, we're booking the travel to this company and which tests can you come for? And just, you know, went through it all with them. And, um, and they said, oh, OK, that, that's, that's great. We'll come back to you. And they rang later and said, yeah, that's fine. We've got a pass sorted for you. These are the dates. And then they said it, it'll cost this much money. And I was expecting it to cost money. And I was fine. I'd just, I'd just done a panto. And they, and they said, uh, shall we sell them the bill just to BBC Scotland? And I said, no, don't, no, don't do that. Said, send it to me and, I, and I'll, 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 get, I'll recoup the money back from them. Because I thought that would go very badly wrong if they were sent a bill with my name on. And so that's what I did. I went out. I have got on a playing at Heathrow, which was just mainly cricket journalists and former players and stuff. <laughs> I stayed there for a month, just traveling around with them, just going into the press box for the games. I was just trying to do what they did, trying to look busy in the hope of getting some work. I got a n none. <laughs> it, didn't, <laughs> it did not work at all. If I were to close by asking you what you wanted to do in the future, I imagine you'd say more of the same. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, more, more of the same, um, less of it, but bigger. Oh, I like that. Less of it, but bigger. Yeah. Until we meet again, when, when we're allowed to meet, I send you all my very best. Likewise. Um, um, yeah, it's, I'm very flattered to be asked to do this by you, Rob. I mean, when I think of the, some of the names that must be in your Rolodex, <laughs> uh, it's, it's extraordinary. So thank you. Oh.